Hey, what's going on? It's Doug here. And today we're going to talk about creating a successful, profitable niche site in 2022 and, and beyond. I think this will probably work for the next couple of years. I'm usually pretty conservative. We have some folks in the crowd here. We got uh, Lewis and we also have Mark and we have Gauz and Adrian. So thanks everyone for hopping on. We have a, a nice little crowd here. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. I think that you can. I tested myself. It doesn't always work, but it usually does. So let me know in the chat. You'll notice my voice is uh, it's a little scratchy. I have been out of town and I'll catch you up on some of those activities, of course. I do tell some stories if people are tuning in uh, for the first time. The way we'll sort of structure this today, I'll, I'll talk a little bit sort of higher level. We'll get into a few quick announcements. We'll hop into the, uh, you know, the steps because what we're going to do is talk about building a successful, profitable niche site, an authority site, a site uh, where probably you have affiliate links and affiliate reviews and revenue from there, physical and digital products most likely, and then also display ads too. So I like to, I like to have all that stuff in the mix there. And then we'll answer questions. There'll be questions throughout, but we'll probably um, hit some, there's always some random questions. So we'll hit those towards the end if they are somewhat off topic. Just to keep it clean, there are a couple links in the description here, and I wanna encourage you to check those out. And a couple of those are, one, there's a three-part mini course that I actually started sending out yesterday. So you can still sign up. You'll just get the second two parts, but if you if you want the other part, you can shoot me an email. So you you could sign up there, nichesiteproject.com slash mini course. And basically it's, there, this mini course will help you get excited and motivated to either start a site or grow your existing site. If you sign up and you want the first part, I can send it to you. Just shoot me an email, doug at nichesiteproject.com. Additionally, there's a link if you're unable to watch the whole thing. If you want to read the uh, guide, there's a link over uh, along with the steps in the description. So you could check it out there. I actually, uh, now that I'll make an announcement here, I'm going to probably update those, those eight sections, which amount to tens of thousands of uh, words <laughs> of content. It's a lot of content, but it's very thorough. But I'm going to go and update it. It's been, you know, probably a couple of years. Generally, I'm fairly conservative on how I my strategies are, so they're not the sexiest, newest things, but they tend to work, and they tend to work for sort of the long haul. Anyway, you could pop over to that guide. Another quick note: and Adrian and David are our fine moderators. Adrian uh, put the link to the mini course. Of course, you could check it in the description there. Couple other quick things, um, which I won't harp on for too long. We do have sponsors for these. So we have Otis Global, and I recorded uh, an ad earlier, which I'll take a little break somewhere along the way to let my voice rest. They have premium age domains over there, and we're gonna look at a featured one. So you can check it out. If you join using my affiliate link, you can get $100 in your account, and potentially, if you buy something, I get a commission. Further, we have Ezoic and their product Leap that'll help your website load faster, get green and core web vitals, along with many other tools. One of my favorites is the section that's uh, big data analytics. You could dial in and figure out which posts, which pages are earning the most money from a uh, visitor standpoint, earning per thousand visitors, EPMV. And that's super helpful because then you can understand like, oh, this kind of content is pretty profitable and this other content is not profitable. So thanks a lot to our sponsors. All right, let's hop back over to the chat. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're actually gonna cover something today, very specific, that's building a site. And we're gonna go through, uh, I listed eight steps here 
you can group them together so there's only like four, or you could expand them out so there's like a hundred. We're going to go uh, sort of medium level. We're going to go into some details, but we will uh, largely be on the higher level generally. So let's hop back to the chat and I appreciate everyone saying hello here. So we have Philip on here as well, Marcus. We have Niche Site Dojo also. And people can hear me. Daniel asks how I'm doing. So I'll explain my uh, scratchy voice. I know a lot of people are filing in at this point in time. So I'll uh, buy some time and get to the point. And when people watch this later, uh, some kind soul started to put in some timestamps when I hit certain uh, points in time here. So it'll be great as I shift from step to step. We could even say it in the chat because I know people watch this later, more people watch it later, and they'll be able to put all the timestamps into the comments so people could just skip around. And uh, John's here as well. We have uh, Philip ask a question here, which I'll actually get get to um, right away. So Philip says, have I noticed affiliate sites that have bounced back and recovered um, f due to the Google algorithm updates? And yes, I've actually heard from several people in the audience. I'm going to do some updates soon. So a lot of sites were hit a couple months ago. People largely didn't do anything. And then it bounced back somewhere around September 25th and traffic um, seems to have gone up to either where it was or potentially even higher. Your mileage could vary, it always uh, always does, but generally uh, a lot of sites have recovered and that's obviously very good. All right, um, let's see, John says, writing Kindle eBooks, low competition, high volume keyword, Jasper may assist developing, oh, what, what the fuck am I reading here, all right. Ghost writing could help get inks in your sentiments. What? The, uh, John, let's rephrase this. It looks like a, a bunch of nouns separated by commas. So I, I don't know. Let, let's rephrase it, John. I, I don't know what you're saying. Writing Kindle, ebook, low competition. All right. Yeah, we'll come back to it. Sonia, what's going on? And let's see. Salim is asking about AI content. A nomad overseas. So I'm going to flag these. And I'm going to come back to them. All right. Um, John says, okay, so he clarified in a much simpler way. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't mean to be a jerk there. I just I don't understand <laughs> what you were saying. All right. And then we'll jump to the meat and potatoes. We have a couch here as well. Thanks for hopping in. Okay. Thoughts on writing eBooks to help with a website and sell those books on Amazon. That is a valid way to approach it. I, I don't know exactly what sort of number of percentage uh, or what success rate someone could expect. I know some people have done a good job on like the Kindle store SEO. They put in a little uh, bit of a a teaser or say, hey, you can get more information if you go to my website. And then they end up with a kind of a, a different traffic stream that's coming through Kindle. I actually have a friend, um, she's in a different industry, but she has uh, a few, few books. She's like a self-published bestseller and she's, you know, speaks at conferences and stuff like that, um, has a huge Instagram and TikTok following and she makes over six figures from her Kindle books. I think she has like two or three. So these are like high quality, like not churning out a lot of books. I know there's a business model where you just kind of publish a lot of, a lot of books that may be subpar. But I would say, John, it's a, it's a valid way to do it. Um, as far as like helping with a website, you could earn a little bit of money Typically, you know, Kindle books are not going to sell for all that much. It doesn't mean you can't have a high volume of sales, though. So with that said, it's something to try. Uh, this is one of those areas where I would caution people to not get distracted and try too many things. I know you can start a podcast and you can start a YouTube channel to help out with a website. You can go to TikTok and you can do all this other stuff. 
each of them are valid. Each of them can work really well. They can add to the sale price if you actually sell the site in the future. It can diversify revenue streams and traffic sources, all these great things. But there is a, a cost in time and effort, and you have to spend time learning about it as well. So let's get into, I'm going to, uh, I see there's a lot of questions. We got Dougie Fresh with um, asking about the business. Um, and I'm going to just mark a couple of these and I'm going to come back to it because we're going to try to hit the steps of starting a website. I know a lot of people here, let me know in the chat or in the comments later, if you already have a site or if you're thinking of starting one. So this is one of those where I know a lot of, a lot of our usual audience, they probably already have sites like Gaz and uh, Daniel does and Philip and uh, many others here as well. So you kind of already have an idea of what's going on. But if you haven't started one, this will be good. The, the other thing is people are you know, often starting more sites and starting new ones. You can also go back and iterate on certain portions of it. And I'll highlight those as we go. Again, if you want to follow along or read this later, you could follow the link in the description. It's siteproject.com slash Amazon dash affiliate. So number one, you have to pick your market or select the niche. And I've done some longer form videos on this, some live streams just like this one. So you can go back and look in the archive and um, see you know, some of the steps that you can take to come up with an idea. When you first get started, I think it's a little bit intimidating and you maybe don't know where to focus. You don't know which niches are, are going to be profitable. You may not know too much about keyword research, so you're not even sure if like key, you, know, you need to do keyword research or you don't know how to check to see if people are actually searching for the ideas and topics that you might be writing about. So... One thing I have been encouraging people to do over the last couple of years, I would say, is pick something that you're interested in, maybe even passionate about, but don't pick something that just looks like a good money grab. Don't pick something that looks like um, you maybe will get bored with it or you just don't care about. If you pick something that you just don't care about, whenever you hit any sort of plateau, whenever, whenever you're not getting traction, when you don't have the momentum that you're looking for, then if you're not interested, it's really easy to either quit or move on to something else and effectively quit, at least quit working on that project. So if you're interested or you're passionate, you don't have to be passionate. Some people aren't really passionate about, um, something uh, specific and they, they just they don't know they have a couple light hobbies or whatever the other portion of that is if you pick something that you're really passionate about and you start a project that will end up being you know a lot of work then it becomes work and you hear this um, you know sometimes with I don't know pick something like a photographer or like a baker right they maybe they bake things as a hobby and then they open a cupcake shop and then they're baking cupcakes all day long, all night long, and they get burned out. They get burned out with their hobby. Or photography, maybe they like taking photos and they like to, to travel around and then they end up doing like wedding photography and they don't like dealing with the clients, for example. So a lot of different scenarios where you can take a hobby that you're passionate about and then ruin it by making it work. So you kind of have to understand your specific personality, your working style, how much you actually like um, the work that you will be doing and the, the topic area. So like I said, if you're interested in it, that's great. If, if it's something that you're interested in, but you haven't had the time to spend on it, that's perfect because then you can learn about it and you're interested and then you have a reason to go deeper and do research and understand. So one place to start from a strategic standpoint is go to 
Amazon or a similar marketplace and just look at the product areas, look at the different departments, and you can start somewhere that you're familiar with. You can go somewhere that you're not familiar with and see if something new, some original idea pops up, but just browse around, you know, do this, uh, you know, a couple times a day for a week or two, and you'll have a ton of ideas, you know, just write them, write them down on paper and you can have a list and you could keep diving into certain areas that seem a little bit interesting. So the reason, you know, you, you go to Amazon, even if you want to monetize in different ways, aside from Amazon, they just have so many products and it's a really easy way to navigate and see what things people are buying. So you can also discover a bunch of products you didn't know existed in an area that you're, uh, you know, do, doing research in that you are, you're familiar with it, you're interested, but you just don't know all the products that are out there. So, and I'm just going to rewind just a little bit because I told you there were eight steps and I, I started right away, like pick a niche. So I'll tell you the eight steps really quickly. Select a niche or a market, do some keyword research. That's number two. Number three is build the website. Number four is write the content. Number five is to plan your SEO, right? So there's a lot of approaches to do that. Number six is to execute a promotion or outreach campaign. Number seven, if you want to, is to do some email marketing. And finally, eight is to scale. The last couple, maybe two to three, are optional. You, a lot of people just don't want to do any outreach. They don't want to do any promotion and it's just easier for them to work on. But I would say if, you know, if your business becomes a little more mature, then you maybe need to do that to grow. You might need to go out there and market your site, which effectively that's what it is. And then email marketing is totally up to you, but it's a great way to diversify your uh, some, sometimes traffic, but it's a way to connect with your audience directly. And finally, scaling. You know, if you want to scale, you can. If you don't, if you don't want to, that's fine. And some people scale by creating multiple sites. Other people scale by growing one site that's doing really well. So those are the eight steps. Again, you could check out uh, some of the details in the link in the description. So number two is around keyword research. And this is uh, another area where I've done a lot of videos. I suggest you check out the Keyword Golden Ratio playlist. I didn't link in the description, but you could, you could check it out. And you can find uh, videos on YouTube that I've done about the Keyword Golden Ratio. You'll also find uh, opponents of the Keyword Golden Ratio, which is fine. You could check those out too and you know, make an informed decision if you wanna use the keyword golden ratio and effectively it forces you to find very low competition long tail keywords so it's a tool that you can use there's a lot of uh you know paid tools out there one that i like and usually suggest and the ones that i have a lot of demos on there's one called kw finder and i'm an affiliate for that there's a link in the description but you could save i think 10 percent and there's potentially a trial there Sometimes those promos change, but uh, KW Finder is the one I like for sort of pure keyword research, but there's a lot of others. And frankly, I don't care. I'm not dogmatic. Like all the tools are fine. It is, I mean, there's so many of them out there and most of them do um, as good a job as you need. So that is totally up to you. And I have no, I have no dog in the race. I don't care which tool you use. And I don't think any of them you know, give you a huge advantage over another. So use one that you're comfortable with. So KW Finder is great. Hrefs is great. Although I would say it's an expense, it's, it's a whole suite of tools that does a lot more um, than what most people need. The data, the backlink database is probably the, the best out there. And I, I was going to say, KW Finder also has a suite of tools. KW Finder is one of the tools within the suite, um, but there are several other tools there also. The other sort of big one to mention is SEMrush. So SEMrush, um, I think, 
they're fine. I haven't used them in a little while, um, but also a fine tool. So John mentions using uh, keyword research to locate a niche you can easily write about without investing on images. So you can crank out articles quicker for an info or product site. And Chris, well, what's up, Chris? Uh, K, uh, keyword research was my favorite step along the way. The KGR concept added another level of focus. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, like I said, the keyword golden ratio, I have a bunch of videos on it. Um, I talked about it a lot. And there are other videos on YouTube where people are like, it's a bad idea. Don't do it. It's the worst idea ever. Those are typically clickbait. And generally, um, people are bringing up valid points. So it's, it's a tool that you can use. And uh, I never uh, intended someone to only use the keyword golden ratio um, or anything like that. So some people treat it dogmatic. And then there's like, you know, fucking YouTube, you know, people are like trying to get some views and stuff. So they'll create videos and they're kind of dicks about it. But that's okay. I like it that they're talking about me and I appreciate it that they took the time to make a video uh, in a negative light because that's, that's fine with me. At least they're still thinking about me. So I, I like that. So keyword research can go very deep. We're not going to go too deep today, but I will say that you also don't need a tool. So one really effective way is to hop over to uh, Google and you could just start, uh, you know, typing in uh, search phrases. So let me, uh, let me see. I'm going to share my screen in just a second here. Oh, yeah. So I, I can't remember which uh, marketplace I was looking at, but there was a website there for sale. And they, you know, they tell you what the, the site is. So you can go kind of take a look. And this was a pretty, uh, I would say a pretty minor uh, product area, very niche. So let me share my screen. I think this will work. Great. It was like for hitches and hitches, you know, you could, I don't know if people could see this while I'll zoom in for a second here. So these like hook into the back of your automobile so that you can haul stuff. So I just started typing best hitch. So, right. So all of a sudden best hitch. And I think you can see the drop down there. So this is just Google auto suggest. And I happen to be using a tool here called Keywords Everywhere, which is a very economic tool. I forgot to mention it earlier, but it, it's a, a Chrome uh, and probably other browser plugin. And it'll give you search volumes in places like Google Auto Suggest and related keywords over here. But you get the idea. So I just typed in best hitch. And then we have for a travel trailer, for a bike rack, ski rack, cargo carrier, receiver, basket, bike rack for two bikes, for four bikes. And you can see here that the search volume of, you know, varies for each one of these, but you could have a hitch website and there was one for sale and it was making hundreds of dollars per month. I don't know how old it was, but yeah, if you searched around, you may find other sites in this area. Um, and if you just type in four, then it'll sort of narrow it down. So number one, we have different uses as we saw before, but now we see it for different cars. So one of my friends, Alex Cooper over at WP Eagle, I think he's doing a live stream later today. I can't remember what time somebody could let me know in the chat here, but he had a site on uh, roof boxes called best roof box. And this is a similar thing. So there's best hitch for Subaru Outback, Subaru Crosstrek, really heavy on the Subaru, uh, Honda CRV, Honda Odyssey, F-150, Silverado 1500. You see where we're going with this. All of a sudden, there's like hundreds of keywords that are all about hitches. So I, I am sure, I hope someone <laughs> takes this. You could build a website on hitches. Maybe, maybe that. That is, uh, I don't know if I'm going to do this. It's always more work than you think, but do a public site on, you know, hitches. I probably won't do it because I, I would potentially start it quietly and not tell anyone about it. So there's fewer copycats right off the bat. But um, basically, you can write about hitches for a specific use, like the bikes, like the skis, like the, the cargo box or whatever for a travel trailer or for a specific car of which there are hundreds. 
there are also different models of the specific car. So that should be plenty of uh, different keywords that you could approach. And thanks, folks. People are telling me that Alex will go live in about 90 minutes. So I think he shifted his time because I used to go right before him. So man, maybe I'll shift my time too. So anyway, you could just go to Google and use auto-suggest and see what comes up. The other thing that you can do is when you Google one of these, so let's actually Google one of these, we'll say for a travel trailer, we can have a quick look and see what pops up. When you look at what's out there, so we have uh, rvweb.net. So I'll, I'll click on this. I don't know anything about this site. And it's written by Stephen. And uh, the, it was fact-checked by William Turner. And you, you can see it's um, a website with reviews. So that, that's cool. The, the reason why we're taking a look at this is they wrote a lot of content. There's a lot of stuff here with uh, appliances, bedroom and interior. We have kitchen, we have awnings, and so on. And a lot of these were published like in the last couple days. So this is interesting. Yeah, so all of these are published like October 2nd. Well, there's like a shitload of them too. So anyway, the point is you can have a look and see what competitors are writing out there as well. Let me show you a quick trick. So another thing you could do if you're just like, hey, all right, I found this site. There's a lot of stuff there, but I'm not really sure about it. So what you can do is just see what they have indexed in Google here. So you can type in site. That's an advanced Google search command. So you type in site and see how many things are indexed. And we see about 214. Now, not all of those are going to be specific keywords that you can target, but it'll give you an idea of what's out there. And I don't know anything about this site. It just happened to be you know, random here. But there's going to be some other keywords that are, in, or other pages that are indexed, like maybe the about page, maybe some category type pages. And that's going to make an impact. So have a look, but you'll still be able to find plenty of different products. And this one's cool because it's kind of around the RV um, area. Right, so this is a perfect way to approach it, and then what you can also do is just you know, same deal, right? You can find some of the other other sites that are ranking, um, which you know we can go on and on, but a lot of these are about RV type um, uses. So uh, here's Parked in Paradise in the RV living section. And yeah, there you go, right? So again, we have tons of different websites. And if you do this a few times, next thing you know, you have more keywords than you know what to do with. Your limiting factor will probably be either your time or the amount of money that you have to hire writers. So this one is parked in paradise and it has 511 results in here. Again, some of these may be category pages. Some of these may not be um, keywords that you can go after, but it gives you an idea of what you can do. So we have best camping in Illinois and teardrop camper designs for adventure travel. So you can see if you, I, I had zero ideas when we started and there's already, you know, there's more keywords than you can go after. And we started with something very narrow, uh, which is the hitch. And I just got the idea because I happened to look at a website yesterday where one of those was uh, one of those websites was for sale. So we started very narrow on a specific product. So let's zoom out a little bit and think about searching on Amazon and maybe you go camping occasionally and you know about hitches and you thought, oh, there's a hitch. Um, there's a lot of products about hitches and, and cargo and such. Maybe I'll do a little research on that. Then we Googled it. We did auto suggest. We got a handful of keywords, uh, probably you know 20 or 30 uh, that we saw. And then if you expanded it out, I think you could probably come up with 150 to 200 keywords in about 30 minutes, something like that. Then 
you could do some light competition analysis as we just did. And we found two sites that uh, one of them had about 500 posts, the other one about 200 at least indexed URLs in Google. And then from there, you have another few hundred keywords. Again, more keywords than you will probably need. Some of these are gonna be too competitive. Some of them will um, you know, just be something that you'll have to grow into. But still, plenty of keywords out there. And the fact that you see multiple sites, it is validating the niche. So people ask, is this a profitable niche? Is that a profitable niche? What's the most profitable niche? If you find competition out there like we just did, then you know that it's profitable. If you find products that are selling on Amazon, it's profitable. Otherwise, there would not be any companies out there selling those products. So pretty easy to validate as far as like how much competition it will be. That's something a little bit deeper and you will have to look. Now, you know, if you take a look and you see the competitors have, you know, 500, 1,000 posts or something like that, that is slightly more uh, difficult. However, even if there are some big players in your niche, then you can still approach longer tail keywords and figure out how to serve the visitor best and solve the visitor problem and really think about the search intent and you can be more specific. Often you can be more specific. Sonia says, what's the best way to do competitor research? We don't really know how much they're making. And you won't be able to find out how much they're making, by the way. So that's not, that should not be your goal. The best way to do competitor research is to go look at their sites, like do what we just did. Go look at their sites, look at the quality of the content, look at the length of the content, look how much content they have, and you can kind of understand what you're up against from a qualitative standpoint. On the other side, and I think it's important to do both of these analyses, so you do the qualitative, but you should also look at some of the metrics as well. So that could be just you know simple metrics that you can go look up from third-party sources, so the domain rating, the domain authority, the trust flow, maybe some of the specifics for URLs to get an understand, like do they have a lot of backlinks going to that post or, or not? So when you're looking at some of the really long tail keywords like you will often find with a keyword golden ratio type term, then you don't really need to do too much analysis. You should still Google a term before you write the content on it to see what's out there. You may discover that all the results are YouTube videos. And if you're not creating a YouTube video, it will be very difficult for you to rank that. That's just the way it goes. And that means the search intent is closer to, uh, you know, it's a video, right? So the search intent, the people wanna see a video. Google know that, they tested it and if you're not going to create a video, then maybe it's not the best keyword. Maybe you could find you know, a similar keyword that's close to the same idea, but the results are other info sort of uh, content sites or product review sites. Another one you might see is all e-commerce type results. So that means people want to buy something. They don't want to see a text in a narrative. They just want to go to a, a checkout page or something like that. So quick pause here. Uh, I see we have quite a few folks on. So I will answer questions. So if you, if you want to ask in the chat, that's fantastic. If they're unrelated to what I'm talking about, then I may hold it towards the end. But uh, generally, you can ask away. I will mark them and hopefully I'll come back to them. So a uh, quick recap. So, so we first select the niche and then you do some keyword research, sometimes with a tool, sometimes through competition analysis and so on. The third step is to build the website. So that's fairly straightforward. And basically, you're probably going to use WordPress. 
The hosting company doesn't matter too much. Most of them are fine. Don't go with the super cheap option and don't go with a super expensive option. But I would say you should be able to find a hosting that is uh, good enough for, I would say, 10 to $15 per month, uh, plus or minus, I don't know, five bucks, something like that. So you should be able to find a hosting company. I, I use uh, two specifically. One's called SiteGround. The other one is called MDD Hosting. SiteGround is a bigger company and MDD Hosting is sort of, uh, sort of a smaller shop and both are fine. Um, most hosting companies have servers that are gonna be fast enough for whatever it is that you need to do. If you get the cheapest hosting from any hosting company, even a good one, it will often be kind of slow. It's a shared server. You're on the server with hundreds of other people. When you start getting more traffic, then you should probably upgrade to something more expensive that provides you with more resources. So that's the thing, right? You can get hosting for pretty cheap and it'll be fine for a while. It'll be a little slower because you're sharing the processor and the memory with a, you know so many other people and they allot you a certain amount. The server takes a little while to respond back when you do that. And that's okay, it's, it's cheaper. You don't have a lot of traffic and it's not a big deal. When you start getting more traffic, it will be important to upgrade your hosting. It'll be very important to upgrade your hosting. You should be earning money so you're just paying for the infrastructure that is required to support the amount of traffic that you have for your site. That is okay. So once you hit a certain level, and I'll, I'll give you some broad sort of benchmarks, but once you hit a certain level of traffic, you'll probably need to upgrade and it may cost you instead of say $15 a month, it might cost you $100 a month. And then when you get a little more traffic and you're getting whatever, 10,000 visitors a day on your site, then you may have to upgrade your hosting again. And it may cost you, you know, a couple few hundred bucks a month for hosting. I would encourage you don't try to skimp <laughs> too much. If you're earning, you know, if you're earning eight or $12,000 per month, it's all right to pay for some hosting, have offsite backups, take care of your infrastructure, take care of your infrastructure. And when you hit a certain point, like you're going to, you're going to know I need to upgrade. I'm earning it. I'm earning enough money and it is okay to pay for a little bit more. Hopefully you can check with a hosting company and ask them, you know, how much, you know, roughly how much traffic should I be able to handle on this plan? Do I, do I need to upgrade? And, you know, from a, one perspective, right? They're going to say, yeah, definitely upgrade for sure. Upgrade. They're salespeople, right? But many websites do have a little guideline. This hosting package can handle 100,000 to 500,000 visitors per month. Hopefully they do have a little benchmark like that. Often they will show you or they will um, tell you the number of uh, processors. They'll tell you the number of, um, yeah, processor cores and the amount of memory and that sort of thing. Sometimes the uh, bandwidth and capacity, but that stuff you could check out. Again, it's a commodity, fairly straightforward. And I do use uh, SiteGround. And there's a link in the description for which I am an affiliate. One cool thing with the MDD hosting is they, uh, I think once or twice a year, they'll actually reward their existing customers. So L uh, Couch here says Black Friday deals are great for hosting if you can wait, which is true. Oftentimes those are good deals for one year and then the prices go up. Those are for new customers typically. MDD hosting will send an email to their existing customers and they give you a discount. So it's kind of a, I understand why they're doing it. They basically say you can deposit money into your account and they'll give you like an extra 10%. So I think it's up to like a thousand bucks. So whenever the deal comes around, I say, sure, I'll do that. So I give them a thousand dollars 
and I get 1100 into my account. So it's like a 10% discount and they reward their existing customers, which is unusual and you don't typically see that. So, all right. There is a um, couple, couple questions here. So I'm gonna mark them if they're relevant or, or not. And I will hop back. Um, okay, so one here, the anointed uh, church here says, can you please show us a demo of how to do the keyword golden ratio? So I'm not set up currently to do a, a good demo of that. However, if you go to my channel, you will see there's a playlist and there are demos within the playlist. So I think a couple of the videos uh, right at the beginning of the playlist show you exactly how to do it. There's a calculator that you could download. And that was a good time for me to make two quick uh, points. So you could download all my templates and systems and stuff like that. If you follow the link in the description, nichesiteproject.com, enter your name and email, and you have to confirm, you'll get an email and you have to click yes, I want, I want to get emails from this dude. And then you'll get another email right after that. And it has a link and the systems and templates are all there, including a calculator for the keyword golden ratio. It's just a Google doc that you can make a copy of and you're able to you know, use the calculator. It's free. Additionally, you can hit the thumbs up. If, if this video is helpful, um, it'll be great if you could hit the thumbs up. It'll help other people find it. And yep, so right now, not a good time to do a demo, more of an overview, but there are plenty of demos that you can see. And if you go to nichesiteproject.com and look for the keyword golden ratio post, you'll see um, a description. There's frequently asked questions. There's other details um, that, will, that will help you out. All right. So I'm going to answer a few questions here because some of them are related to keywords. And quick recap, so we did select a niche. We talked about keyword research and we also talked about building the website. So find hosting, find a theme. There's themes out there. Um, I think page builders are a waste of time. I think page builders will slow you down. There's not a big benefit to use them. I know a lot of the designers and stuff will have a different opinion. That's cool. Um, but for me, I, I like the simplicity. And one of the big things no one pays attention to, but if you use a page builder and then you want to move from that theme to another one, or let's say you want to sell your website, migrating to another theme represents a huge headache and a huge amount of work that is really just unnecessary. So the simpler you could keep it, the better. It really works out better if you can keep it simpler. Page builders sometimes will uh, like look better, but it's usually at a cost of either time or speed. And there are ways to use page builders that are faster and it keeps it lean and that is okay. But I've definitely seen people burn a huge amount of time putting uh, little shaded boxes and buttons and changing the color and you know trying to make it look better it really looks like a train wreck or if it looks good it takes a lot of time and i don't enjoy any of those activities so i i don't spend much time on it and i don't put much much value in it so that's my approach though i mean think the thing is people are people are just looking on their phones and they just want it to load fast and they really don't care too much how it looks as long as they can read it typically. So anyway, you can head over to uh, niche, niche site project.com. There's a link in the description, sign up for the email list, and then you'll get um, templates, systems. And the thing is this week, there's a uh, free three-part mini course. Part one came out yesterday, but if you sign up and you want to see the, uh, the uh, second two parts, you'll get it tomorrow. And then on Friday, but if you want to see the first part too, I review in the emails, but if you want to see the first part, you can uh, just shoot me an email, Doug at niche site project. And I can, I could send you that first one as well. Okay. So a couple uh, questions. Sonia says, any tips on building topical authority? I can't outrank low DA sites. I'm in the bottom of page one while they're in the top three. 
I would couple areas. So number one, I would check out the competition, see if they're covering the material better. You can sort of consolidate, figure out what um, you have a gap in from all the other sites and then add that to yours. Additionally, you can have supporting articles that are in that topical area that are very low competition, very long tail, maybe zero search volume that are in that topic area and very specific. And then you can link those together. Uh, your supporting articles can link to the one that you're trying to rank and the other supporting articles can link to each other. That's one approach to boost your topical authority. And let's go. All right, next. Uh, Daniel says, what's the best way to embed a YouTube video, not mine, into a post? Ezoic Leap doesn't seem to like it. So I am not sure specifically for Ezoic uh, Leap. What I use is a... YouTube performance plugin by DIY plugins. I think I'm an affiliate for it, but I don't have a link handy or anything like that. But essentially what it does, it doesn't embed the YouTube video, which actually takes a little while to load. It'll slow your site down if you do um, one YouTube embedded video. If you do a lot of them, it'll slow your site down more. Just test it and you can see this in, in real time. But the YouTube performance plugin and similar strategies will load the thumbnail and put a little play button on top of it. The visitor has to click the play button and then it'll load the video with the controls and then they can play it. So they have to click twice. You may be thinking, hey, that seems bad for the visitor. It turns out only something like 10 to 15% of visitors watch the video. So are you trying to optimize for 10 to 15%, which you should not do? Or should you optimize for the majority of the people, which you should do. So in that case, you could use a tool like the YouTube performance plugin or a similar one. I think WP Rockets, is that the name of it? So that speed optimization plugin will do something similar. Uh, Leather Art says, what would you do with keywords that are showing in hrefs, but we don't have them in our same article? You could put them in the article. You could put a section in there for the article. If it doesn't fit or you don't want to put it in there, then you could create another post and then you know you could link to it from other articles that exist, which is what you should probably do. All right. So um as we're going through here. All right, so this this is a classic question. Uh, so can you mention some good niches that have potential? So I encur I do encourage you to, to rewind and watch earlier when I talked about selecting a niche, but basically if you find um, competitors, if you find products, if you find any sign that there are businesses that exist around the niche that you're thinking of, then it has potential. So it means people are making money. If you see companies are running ads, uh, Google AdWords, for example, you see they're running ads when you Google the term, then that means that they're making so much money that they're spending money on ads and marketing, which means that you can earn some of that money from the, the marketing budget. So almost anything has a lot of potential. If you go to Amazon and just start browsing in departments, then you'll see products that are selling. One thing that's really helpful, and I think, you know, a lot of people have mentioned this, but Tim Ferriss often says, um, you know, he was thinking about products that he buys, like in the four hour work week. Like, what does he spend money on? What does he spend money on where he's insensitive to the price? It's so important that he will spend money on it regardless of how much it costs. Very elastic spending on it. So I know for you know some of the stuff that I have, uh, uh, supplements, which is actually what I think Tim eventually started his company with, 
is you know, supplements, um, protein, like things that are health related often for me, I'll, I'll pay what it costs, you know? Okay. As we're going through here, Marcus does say, I use a page builder from Cadence and the Google score is 100 and super fast, so it doesn't mean slow sites, but there are page builders that do make sites slow. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other, the other part, right? So I'm giving you a sort of a broad overview and then some things that I've learned. The other thing that you will learn that makes all this so confusing is there's, there's uh, so many ways to do things that it's confusing and there are fantastic counterpoints to every single thing I've said. <laughs> you can make an argument, valid arguments that I will agree with you on that, um, yeah, there's another way to do it. And there is. And yeah, you could use a page builder that's fast. Um, you could use um, a page builder that's slow. And you, you could use a hosting company that generally is good, but they have failed you in some way. And that's typically when people change hosting companies. Something bad happens and then they, they switch. All right. So a lot, of, a lot of questions here. Okay. So John says, keyword golden ratio is awesome. Cranking out posts faster is a better idea. Niche website builders, um, 2,000 posts in four months. They spending 300,000. Your thoughts, Doug. All right, John, I have a suggestion for you. Um, can you can you write uh, the, these in question form? It's um, it, sometimes your questions don't make sense until you rephrase it. So pretend I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm just reading words on a page. All right, and John further says, don't waste time making it pretty. Uh, just pump out helpful content, low fruits, clusters of articles. Okay. And okay, as we're going through. All right, cool. So we made it through a lot of things. And thanks everyone that has already hit the thumbs up. Really appreciate it. And I'm going to take a super quick break here um, because my throat is a little scratchy. So I'm going to roll uh, a, a very quick ad here from our friends at Otis and it'll, it'll be uh, very quick here. I just need to load it up for you and it'll give my voice just a, a little, a little rest for just a couple minutes here. From our sponsor, Otis Global, that's O-D-Y-S dot global. And they're the source for premium age domains. The feature domain for today is over here called uh, Extinction. What is it called? Ex Planet Extinction. So that that's a really fun topic area. And of course, you could check it out over on the uh, filtering system over here. So this one is a site that used to cover uh like I said, the exciting topic of climate change. So it was a group dedicated uh, to raise awareness about environmental impacts, climate change, and it answered a lot of low competition, long tail keywords. So kind of uh, nice bread and butter. Now, one thing is uh, we could take a look over on the Wayback Machine and you could tell this is kind of a classic look. And by classic, I mean, it's old. And it was created in 2006. So it's pretty old if I'm doing the math right. That's 16 years old. It has a domain rating of 12 and a domain authority of 32. So it's a pretty brandable name. You could, uh, of course, focus a lot on informational topics. And that is what I you know, would probably do, all those long tail keywords. And I think you could probably go into uh, like other sort of renewable energy type ideas since it does fit in with the uh, sort of e extinction, uh, you know, sadness, we'll call it. So you could talk about how people can be a little bit more, um, you know, just conscious about green energy and that sort of thing. So there are 216 referring domains, uh, 169 of them are do follow. They have uh, some pretty cool 
links out there, a lot of edu sites, a lot of .gov. So there's uh, aph.gov.au. We have uh, unu.edu. We have scienceblogs.com. Uh, is that op-ed news? There's, there's some that I don't I don't know how to pronounce, but these are pretty killer links. And I there's San Diego. Uh, San Diego Union Tribune. It's like I can't read anymore. But anyway, there's some kick-ass links out there. A lot of branded anchor text still indexed in Google and generating some traffic. So do check it out over here. As always with Otis, you get a little logo. So they, they give you the logo and you can check out more details over here on Otis. If you join using my affiliate link, you can get $100 into your account, which I greatly appreciate. And... If you actually make a purchase, I might get a commission, which I appreciate too. So let's get back to the show. And thanks again to Otis. All right, I'm back and we can resume. So, so far we've covered uh, selecting a niche. We've talked about keyword research a little bit and then building out the site. Step four is writing the content. And uh, John uh, Rydell uh, mentioned a, a question earlier. I'm not really sure what the question was. So I was asking for clarification in the chat. If anyone knows, feel free to uh, put that in. So next part is writing the content and quick note, and this kind of spans uh, maybe back to the keyword research a little bit, but I recommend that you have some split of informational content and affiliate content. There's uh, definitely a big trend right now, uh, probably for the last two years or so, of just publishing informational content. And that seems you know, really good since Google has released several algorithm updates that target product reviews. The downside with purely informational content is display ads typically don't pay as much on a per visitor basis as affiliate commissions will pay. There's always trade-offs though. So I, I think if you have a nice split, then it does sort of insulate you from product review update type issues. And it also helps out from the uh, just display ads, uh, sort of shorter form, informational how-to content. So if you have both of those, that's great. And I would say anywhere from say 50 to 90% informational content is a good range. It's up to you to figure out what range you want to aim for. I have a particular site right now where I started it uh, sort of 50-50 informational and product review. Or sorry, yeah, informational and product review type content. And the informational content got great traction and I leaned into it and then it shifted to, I would say, 90% informational content. What I realized after some time is the informational content was earning a very small amount of money on a per visitor basis. The traffic was exploding, growing very well, and it was looking great. It just wasn't earning enough. So at this point, I'm shifting. There's two areas where I'm sort of shifting. I'm actually publishing more affiliate review, product review kind of content. And I'm also identifying any specific topic areas that have a higher earnings per thousand visitor. That's EPMV. And I'll hop over to Big Data Analytics on Ezoic and then just sort by EPMV, and then I can see these are the posts that are earning the most money on a per visitor basis. So then I understand this topic area is actually more profitable, and you could kind of reverse engineer and understand that it's because of the availability of advertisers, the type of visitor that would show up, the type of searcher, and what their intent is, and if it's a little bit more commercially driven, then you can end up with a higher EPMV. The whole point is when you think about content, you will be publishing some informational content. It's great to have some affiliate products that you could promote. When we talked about selecting a niche, I didn't mention too much on 
the end product and thinking about the affiliate commissions you might earn. So to jump back a little bit, physical products are great. And we did talk about Amazon. So physical products are good. Amazon's easy to sign up for. The um, friction to make a purchase is very low. So it's pretty straightforward to have a review and it's pretty straightforward for the person to buy it if they're interested in it, if it's the right traffic. And other products that you should think about are digital products. So typically those are apps, those are our pieces of software, or they're courses. So an example that I love to use is uh, cameras, camera gear, uh, whether it's uh, photography focused or video, uh, most of the cameras like the one I'm using here, they shoot 4K, they'll take great pictures, they can do both, right? They're you know, fairly, um, they're fairly versatile and they're very high quality. So you can literally buy like a consumer grade camera from like Costco or Sam's or go to Walmart and buy a camera and a pro photographer can like shoot a wedding with it. Like it's fine. They could shoot a fucking movie with it, right? They're very powerful. And the thing is there's software that's associated with using those products and they're somewhat complicated. There's a lot of skill behind it. So there are courses. In fact, I just bought uh, two or three uh, photography courses on Udemy. Uh, they were on sale like they always are on Udemy. So they were like 10 bucks a piece. And they are courses that um, I can take them and I, I learn. And I could actually, you know, refer people and say, hey, you should check out they, you should check out this course. I took it and I learned how to, uh, you know, shoot a movie or film in a more cinematic way, for example. And there are courses on all sorts of things. So if you can refer people to courses, then you could earn money that is uh, a digital product. Typically, those have great commission rates. The other is software. So again, uh, photography, there's video editing software, there's video software, and some of them are becoming even more sophisticated because you may think, well, there's only a handful of video editing uh, software out there. But now there's video editing software that's specifically tailored for social media. So it will put in the uh, transcript and highlight the text as the person is saying it. So those are, those are new. Those are new type products. And there are tons of them out there. There's always stuff like that out there. So if you keep your eye open and you're thinking about this as you're like, oh, what niche should I choose? I want to have diverse traffic sources. I want to have different uh, revenue streams. Then think about digital products for sure. Okay, so writing, actually writing the content and you can write it yourself. And if you have a writing background, that is fantastic. I think that is probably the biggest advantage that I see um, <laughs> for success. So we should all be thinking about the sort of unfair advantage we have. Some people are technically savvy. In fact, a lot of people in my audience do have an IT background. They're good with software. They can set up websites. It's no big deal. Great. A lot of people can do that. Um, technical people can uh, potentially do it more uh like stress-free. They don't have to learn as much perhaps. But the people that seem to do really well have a writing background. And you can write the content yourself. If you're interested in the topic and you kind of know something about it and you have the writing background, you have a huge advantage over your competition, especially if there are a lot of people that are uh, hiring freelance writers on a one-off basis or maybe they're hiring an agency. At best, you'll get okay content uh, that is mostly right and it's gone through some editing from an agency. In the worst case scenario from you know agency or a freelancer, you're getting someone who knows nothing about the topic area and they're just doing research as quickly as they can and they're writing the content as quickly as they can and you end up with um, you know kind of shitty content. So you can edit it yourself but as we'll you know, probably talk about here in a second with uh, John's question here. I see you, you wrote the question. Uh, basically, if you hire an agency, they can do all this heavy lifting for you, 
find the keywords, write the content, give you an image, format it, put it into WordPress, and all you have to do is hit publish. They'll even hit publish for you. So you literally can be completely hands off. However, they are, uh, they're doing it kind of on a quick basis. So you should go through there, either hire an editor or read it yourself and make sure it makes sense and it works. Otherwise, um, you could just end up with some kind of fluffy articles that are not really that great. And someone did ask about AI content. Um, let me find the specific question. This was from much earlier. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Salim says, I uh, hope you are uh, fine. Uh, is it worth to start a niche with AI content? So I would say you can give it a shot. I have created a few videos, uh, little demos using Jasper. And I recently worked with a crew over at outranking.io on uh, a, an accelerator. And I'm not associated with them. I, I didn't accept any payments from them or anything like that. They just needed a niche site expert. And I just hope to essentially do some cross promotion. So I did it because they had an audience interested. I'm an expert in the area. So I helped them out there. Can you use AI? I am aware of several people using AI. So my friend Alex Cooper, who's doing a live stream and uh, looks to be 50 minutes or so. He's used it uh, fairly extensively on some public sites. So you could go check it out. You could go watch his videos. I have a few videos on AI and actually have uh, some AI tools and uh, some resources listed in the description here if you want to check those out. And I haven't tested them a ton. What my observation is so far is most people that are really excited about the AI content are either affiliates or they're selling the product and they own it. Or they're beginners and they're like, hey, I've been able to publish a shitload of content. Um, I don't have the results yet, but you know, it works great. So what I'm looking for, and I've made this request for a couple months now for people that are using AI content and they're earning, we'll say like over $2,000 a month. And it's primarily AI content. I'm still looking for that person or persons. A few people have mentioned that I need to go to some of the Facebook groups and troll around there and see if anyone's interested. I am going to go to the outranking Facebook group because I know someone told me that there are people that are doing pretty well. The thing is, the folks that seem to be earning the most, and you can go find these success stories on my channel. Um, basically, they are writing the content themselves or they have uh, one other person helping them out, one or two other people, but they are spending a ton of time on the content. They're not trying to write you know, five posts a day. They're trying to write one post that's really good, and if it takes them a week or two weeks, it's fine because they're gonna earn so much money from that post that they know it's worthwhile to actually put the time in. So it's so, I mean, I think... I think people get really caught up in how much they're publishing. And again, we'll get to this uh, topic in a second, how much they're publishing and the quality is just kind of shitty. So there's, there's always a trade-off and we have to think about that. And you have to think like, all right, are we just trying to get some traffic on our site? Or are we trying to you know, do a good job here? So, so I don't know. Can you use AI? You can let me know how it works out. I don't know if I, if I am recommending, if my, uh, brother-in-law was like, hey, I'm going to start a site. I was thinking of either writing it myself or using AI content. I would say write it yourself. Pretty much hands down, I, I would bet, I would bet the content that you wrote yourself is going to do better. Okay, let's get back to the questions here. And just a, another quick note, if you're joining now, fantastic. You can rewind for sure. There's a link in the description here that goes to uh, the, a guide where we, we go through the eight steps. And the eight steps are listed in 
the description here. So, okay. So it's very hard on John here. Uh, he says, yeah, my random thoughts. What are your thoughts on niche website builders doing 2,000 posts in four months and spending $300,000? Okay. So another uh, quick thing. I'm doing a live stream with the guys from niche website builders, Adam and Mark, and Alex Cooper from WP Eagle. That's tomorrow on this channel, 8 a.m., mountain time. So you have to translate it to your own time. But if you go to my channel, you'll, you could like set a reminder or whatever you need. You could subscribe, of course, if you want to. But those guys are uh, going to be chatting with me tomorrow about growing a site. We're going to talk about growing a site from $500 to $10,000 per month. What are my thoughts on niche website builders spending $300,000 in four months and doing 2000 posts? It sounds like a cool idea. Um, I don't have an agency like them. So they're, uh, I suspect they're spending a lot of money and they have, uh, or they're, they're spending a lot of money, but it's like generally in-house, right? So I think it'll be a very interesting thing. I wouldn't do it myself, <laughs> right? So it's a, it's a different... Um, we often have debates on the Niche Lifestyle Show hosted on my channel tomorrow. Uh, that's Wednesday, October 5th. And, and basically, I have a different investing strategy and a different asset allocation, which which we all do, right? Um, I, I'm in this whole personal finance community, and they say, oh, personal finance is, is personal. So, like, there's there's no, like, right or maybe there are some wrong things, but there's no specific right way to do something like if that works for them that's fantastic and you could do a lot of other things so i would think about the opportunity cost of three hundred thousand dollars so the opportunity cost um, of what else you could do with the three hundred thousand dollars from a return standpoint it may work out great it, it also is very important to consider your timeline so if you, let me do a quick, um, do some quick math over here. Um, so I am, uh, I follow like the, some of the financial independence ideas. And if you had $300,000 in an index fund. This is not financial advice, by the way. It's just purely entertainment. So if you had $300,000 in an index fund, if you use the 4% rule, which means you could put um, the 300K in, an, in a broad-based index fund, that would be um, 12000 bucks that you could get out of there per year, which is not a ton. It's only $1,000 per month. That would last you sort of in... Definitely. Uh, so a thousand bucks per month, sort of indefinitely. So if you're looking at like some very conservative returns like that, then, you know, maybe investing $300,000 in four months is a good return. I suspect they'll get some traction pretty quickly and they should be able to earn more than the thousand dollars per month. So as far as like making that decision and for them, you know, it's, uh, I suspect, I don't know anything about this project. Um, or if they're actually, I mean, I, I have no idea. It's just a question that came in from John here. So the thing is they'll be able to talk about that a lot. So this is almost a marketing expense, right? That creates an asset that they could sell. They could keep it for cash flow, and they could talk about it all over the place. So as far as 300 K, um, I probably wouldn't do that myself. Um, that would also require a big team and stuff. And I, I came from a corporate job and I had a big team and I ran big projects and I didn't like it that much. So I, I just have a lean team here. So that, that's my take. I wouldn't do it, but that's cool. Someone is. Okay. As we go through, um, Sonia says, do you have any thoughts on the product review update in September? Very little, you know. Uh, the questions are interesting today. It's like, uh, hey, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's the same as the other updates I did. Uh, Sonia, there's like th few videos that I've done 
on the product or on the updates. So you can check those out. But generally, I mean, Google's not telling us too much. It's kind of generic. Create high quality content. Try to help the visitor do your best. You know, it's that kind of advice. So it's, it's a little vague other than, you know, try to do a good job. So I don't have any specific thoughts. I'm, I'm sorry. Daniel says, uh, just a quick one. I have an article ranking number one that has 110,000 search volume a month, but I'm hardly getting 100 visitors a month. Any idea what happened there? Are, no, uh, I would say it sounds like maybe you're not ranking number one. Or <laughs> there's some sort of rich featured snippet situation that is... It is, the result is you don't get traffic because people don't need to go to your site. And a lot of people are asking, like, hey, are you sure you're ranking number one? All right. So going through more questions here. Daniel also says this. Um, Sanzar says, what about web stories? These seem to be bringing in a ton of traffic. So I usually, so I think someone asked about this and then I said, what's a web story? So I don't know what that is, but if it's working for you and it seems to bring in a ton of traffic, you know, fucking go for it. You know, double down. That's great. You'll learn more about it. You could, you could teach people about it and it'll keep bringing in more traffic, but I usually stick to what I know. And, you know, I, I add, I add things, I learn new things and then I know that, and then I, I, I keep doing new things, but, uh, generally, um, I, I don't know what that is. It sounds kind of social media y. So, uh, you know, typically that's kind of a treadmill situation. And, oh, Lance says, can you share Alex Cooper's channel? I've mentioned it a couple of times. Probably someone already shared it. WP Eagle, Adrian did that. Yep, and he'll, he'll be going on here in 40 minutes, one of my buddies. All right, so I think I'm going to try to get through the questions and I'm going to jump back. Like I said, we've gone through uh, several of the sections here. we got pick your niche, keyword research, build the site, write the content, and back to the, the sort of content idea, um, as far as length, just from a, a broad general perspective, I would say most of the content that you write can be between 500 and 1500 words, give or take. There are certain topic areas where you can write it longer. There is certainly a trend to write longer and longer content until it got to be, you know, five, 10,000 words, really long form content. Now there's a bit of a trend to write shorter content that gets to the point. So it depends on what you're writing about. Shorter content is good for shorter questions, informational based, where you can answer it in a quick way. If you have some broader uh, topics or maybe something that needs to go like in depth, then maybe it's a little bit longer. A good way to decide is to have a look at your competitors and see how long most of the other content is, say in the top 20 for sites that are like yours. So if you're, if you're uh, looking at the results and there are, say, uh, a bunch of e-commerce sites, but you don't have an e-commerce site, you have a content site, then you would ignore the e-commerce sites for the most part from a word count perspective and look at the sites that are most similar to yours. And um, John is mentioning around AI content and says, uh, you know, use it, use AI, but always double, fact, double check the facts and grammar and spelling. And uh, on, the, on the converse, Gaz says, uh, sometimes it takes me two days to write an article. So yeah, the, the thing is, um, there are many approaches and I'll be, like I said, I'll be very interested when the AI side of it the AI users have enough data where they can say, yeah, I'm making full-time income. I quit my job. 
I'm scaling, like I have all this figured out. I love to interview them. However, the most successful people that I've interviewed in the last 12 months, they've written their own content. They've written their own content. And those are just the people that reached out though, right? There's other people that don't want to share their story. Um, oh, and Grant is over here. Oh, what's up, buddy? I haven't seen you in a bit. You changed your channel name, Mindfully Me now. All right, nice. That's a cool little uh, little uh, icon there. I'm trying to make it bigger. Yeah, that's fun. Okay. And, um, oh yeah, Niche Site Tocha says uh, VTI, VTI on the, on the investing front. Yeah. Although it's not investment advice, it's just entertainment. Oh, and Sonia says, you're asking about the product review update because you've been impacted. So I've recorded, we'll, and we'll jump back to this stuff in a second here. So I've recorded a couple interviews, some of which have not been published yet. So I do have uh, Olga from SEO Sly, who I think that episode's coming out very soon. But I've recorded a couple other interviews too. I encourage you to you know either subscribe to the channel or check out the podcast called The Doug Show. I have an audio podcast, but of course we're on YouTube today. But you can... Um, <laughs> Uh, can someone kick Sachin out, please? Just ban him from the channel here for me. Uh, so, yeah, basically, there's not there's not a lot that you can do in a short time, Sonia. But what it comes down to generally is look what posts were impacted. Look if there are some posts that are doing well. And look at your competitors for the same type of information. And then you can draw a strategy from there. It will often take um, a couple months to start some recovery. Uh, some people have said that it, it may be, it might be that you have, uh, you have to wait until the next core update there. So, so yeah, uh, sorry to hear you're impacted and I'm just going to kick Satchin out in case no one did. Okay, so you only have to ask a question once and then we typically see it here. So, and, oh, and, and, and Sanzar says, Web Stories is a Discover News feed feature which Google has introduced. You can post it on your websites. Cool. Yeah, so if it's, if it's working for you, keep doing it. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of approaches that people can take. Okay. So write the content, make it as long as it needs to be. Don't worry too much about like uh, crazy uh, formatting. Some people really like to, you know, make it look good, which is valid. But I would say, you know, think of pe people are on their phones usually Think about how things look on their phones and what you're really trying to do. For product review content, there is a template that I like to use, and it's over at Niche Site Project, um, that Amazon Dash affiliate that you'll be um, you'll be able to take a look at over there. And it's pretty straightforward. You know, I encourage you to look at the template and then go to a place like the wire cutter, and you'll see the components in there. And that's, that's what I did when I put together that template. I looked at a bunch of websites that were sort of best in class. And then I reverse engineered it and looked at, you know, what I used to do and, you know, sort of put it all together. There are pieces that are sort of uh, optional and modular, and you can add, you know, more of them or remove certain pieces or whatever you want to do. And, um, as far as informational content and like how to format that, there are a few different types of informational content, but generally it's like writing an essay. You can have like listicle articles and those are, you know, depending on the industry, those are going to do pretty well. Those are somewhat shareable. It does depend on the topic area. So if it's like 
a how-to article, well, obviously, uh, you, you'll have to probably list out some steps. You probably won't be able to um, have like sort of a listicle type article. So fairly straightforward and one great way to get inspiration and just kind of understand, or at least, I mean, th the fact is when you start your first website, you probably will end up kind of mimicking your competition some. And that's okay until you develop your own style. And it may be more so if you are trying to figure out, um, or if you're writing the content yourself, you will develop your own style. If you are hiring writers to do most of it, then it will most likely be kind of generic. And I think that is part of the issue with outsourcing um, the content where it's not very personal and it's not very, um, it's not like your own uh, writing. But if you, if you are writing it yourself and then you are kind of mimicking your competitors, eventually you'll sort of have your own style that uh, morphs along with what fits in the overall niche and topic area with your own voice in there. And that I think makes a, a big difference. Next, plan your SEO. So generally this is link building. We can sort of view it as outreach and promotion and marketing, which it, it kind of is. I mean, that's probably where it would fit in, but essentially it's getting some links to your site. Google doesn't like us to, to build these links in the webmaster guidelines. They will tell us not to build links, but you know, that is the, one of the voting systems, right? If you have links pointing to your site, Google thinks that means other sites like you, like your site, and that it's something to, to have a look at. And it uh, adds more credibility and authority and all that kind of stuff. So Google's pretty smart. So they know that there are some crappy links out there. So you do have to be careful and, and watch out for all that stuff. But if you treat it as outreach and networking and just letting people know about your site, that's not a bad thing. Like, hey, you know, actually uh, some somewhat despise these emails, but um, it's because they're cold emails. But sometimes I'll get an email. They'll say, hey, I saw you had an article on video for YouTube. And I have an article that's related to video on YouTube. I think it's a good resource. Would you link to it? Because I'm a jaded marketer and I've you know, created a bunch of websites, I, uh, I usually don't do anything with those because those are, those are just cold emails, uh, someone asking me for something, uh, essentially creating work for me <laughs> uh, with, with no, uh, like, no return for me at all. And they'll say, oh, you know, it's a great resource. It's better than other resources out there, which typically is just BS, right? These are just form uh, templates out there. However, if you do network in a more uh, natural way, in a more strategic way, if you maybe go to an industry event and meet people in person, then you may have a great way to reach out to them. Like you have a relationship with them and you can say, hey, you know, I am going to publish this article. Would you link to it? That sort of thing. And eventually my voice is going to give out. So we'll get back to it here. So plan out your SEO. One guideline is if it's a link that anyone can get, then it's probably not that great. And that applies for guest posts too. So one of the strategies that I don't think is as uh, popular, at least not as uh, talked about, is just trying to find sites that allow guest posts. And you would do that by like searching for like guest posts and then maybe the name of your niche or but essentially looking for a write for us page. And if anyone can actually submit and post there, then it's probably not very valuable. The harder it is to get a link, like I said, if you're networking, if you actually meet people or you reach out to them 
on social media, you share their stuff. Maybe you write a little uh, roundup kind of post where you're like, hey, here's my favorite eight Instagrammers. And then you reach out to each one of them and say, hey, I, I featured you here. Just wanted to let you know about it. They're probably going to read it. They're probably going to thank you. A lot of times people on Instagram, not always, but a lot of times they don't have a website. So they're, they're like, oh, great. I'm featured somewhere else. And they may even have a big following and they'll get back to you because it's a, it's a different medium. They don't view you as a competitor specifically. So that is a great way to do, and you can do this on you know, YouTube, you can do it on TikTok, like a- anywhere where the, you can contact people, like you can do that. So you can figure out what works for you. And sometimes building those relationships won't pay off right away, but they'll pay off in the future and they'll be much more powerful. You'll have better opportunities out of it than if you just sent a cold email and got a, you know, kind of a random crappy link. So I combine the, you know, five and six there, plan your niche site SEO and execute your outreach and promotion campaign. And I would encourage you to not do sort of the mass emailings, the merge. I haven't shared this um, yet, but it could be a, a good video. People are using these merge, uh, mail merge apps. These, um, I, I won't say any specific uh, names because I don't know what companies are out there. But basically, they're they're messing up with either their template or their spreadsheet or something. So sometimes it'll say the wrong uh, website. It'll say the wrong uh, article. So basically, they think they're they're like, hey Doug, and then they'll mention another article on a different website, like it's mine. So I know they messed up. So that's bad, you know, when they mess up the template and then I'm, I'm like, this makes no sense. And obviously you guys don't have any attention to detail. And then the second is, this is even worse. This is the fault of the software company, I believe. I'll get an email and I'll reply back. I'll say, hey, that actually sounds interesting. Why don't you tell me a little bit more? I'd love to know. And then I'll get another email back from them that says, hey, I just wanted to bump this email. It looks like you didn't get it before and I didn't want it to sit in your inbox. And then I think, I already emailed you back. I see it in the thread here. You know, what, what are you guys doing over there? Are you, uh, you're just trying to waste my time and you look like idiots and you don't know how to use your software and you're ignoring my email. So there's some issue. Um, Don't do that, all right? Send real emails. That's usually better. Reach out on social media. Chat. It's more personal, right? It's social. There's a mechanism to to ping people, so, so use it. And you can build those relationships. All right, as we're wrapping up here, last two, execute an email marketing strategy. So I am a big fan of email lists. Uh, for YouTube, for uh, podcast, for your niche site, for whatever. It gives you a way to reach out directly to the people that land on your site that want to have like a deeper connection. So that said, please, if you haven't signed up for my email list, there is a link in the description here. It's free. I usually send out um, helpful information, point you towards some uh, videos that I've done in the past, sometimes uh, articles over on Niche Site Project, and so on. So you could sign up for the email list there. And finally, uh, number eight, scale. So you can continue growing your site uh, by maybe adding more content. Maybe it's more link building and promotion, but it can be something that you've neglected before that you need to put more into. Or you can scale by creating several other sites. So if you... And that's usually what people want to do. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, I hear this excuse in uh, a million different ways, but people are like, I have ADHD. I get bored working on the same thing. And it's cool. I mean, er so many people start multiple sites and, um, you know, it's it's fun to start new things. But uh, sometimes the ROI is not going to be as high as if you 
you know, double down on a specific site. And sometimes it's hard to tell, but I can tell you for a fact that you, if you're, you are starting multiple sites, you will be splitting your time. So there's a little overhead, a little mental capacity that's taken up because of that. So, but you can scale. And I think, you know, once you get your footing, it's a great approach. I think usually people can build a, a single site bigger than they do and they're just ready to move on. I'm guilty of this. I've done this so many times. And honestly, I mean, I reached a point where I was like, all right, I'm just going to work on the couple things that are really important. And I started killing projects. And as opposed to, you know, the question earlier, um, John, John uh, mentioned, uh, cheers, John, by the way. So John mentioned, you know, building a site, publishing 2000 articles, spending a huge amount of money on it. I uh, decided to uh, not necessarily stop growth, but I was like, you know, bigger and more and more and more is not what I'm trying to do. So when when the prospect of you're doing more and like you like typing more on this keyboard and sitting at the desk standing actually I'd often stand i thought well i'd rather go outside more and i alluded to it earlier there's actually a link in the description i have another show it's called mile high fi it's around about financial independence and personal finance and I'm, I'm in a good spot where, you know, I've reached a point financially where I don't need to work anymore. It's very nice. So I think a lot of people want that freedom. And what it actually means when you, uh, when you peel back some of the details, it means if you don't need to do something for money, then it means whatever you're doing, you should do for free. So would you... Would you do that activity if you didn't get paid for it? Which is a really weird way to view what you're going to work on. But as we're all getting older and dying slowly second by second here, you don't want to waste time on dumb shit. So while it's uh, perhaps a bit morbid uh, if you don't think about death often, but it's a good way to look at it. Like, do you want to build a site with 2,000 articles and put 300K into it? Maybe, maybe that's a great move for you. But for me, I was like, oh, that doesn't sound like a good move to me right now. (laughs) That sounds uh, like scaling too much. I'd have to have a team of people and uh, I'd rather uh, go outside for a walk real quick or a, a long, long walk. So I think... We hit everything, so quick recap here, and then I'll answer some more questions. So uh, John says, great show, eight steps to freedom. Yeah, so here, here's the deal. So we have the eight steps listed here. A couple of them are optional. Many of them explode into many sub steps here. But number one, you pick a niche or a market. It's great to start at Amazon from a affiliate standpoint. You can find products. I encourage you to think about niches that have digital products that you can promote. So those are going to be courses and software. It's not going to be available for everything, but usually you can find a course on a topic area. So even if you can't find software, there's not software associated with that for some reason, you can usually find courses on almost anything. So go to like Udemy or something like that. And then you'll be able to uh, you know, sort through and look for a bunch of uh, courses. Digital products are great because usually they have a higher commission rate than physical products. Just the math works out that way. Uh, step two is keyword research, which kind of you know goes hand in hand with uh, niche selection. So a couple ideas around that. You can use paid tools if you want to. You can use uh, free options, of course. Uh, just using Google and Google Auto suggest is a great approach. There are several keyword research tools. You could use any one that you want. 
Um, I'm not dogmatic about it. Many of them do fine. It doesn't really matter that much. You just want you know the, the tool to stay out of the way so you can get the data. Quick note on that, uh, keyword research tools report the uh, search volume. Search volumes are an estimate based on historical data. So they're estimates. They're not uh, written in stone. And if you see an exact number for monthly search volume, it's just an estimate. And in fact, usually it's an average of, I think, 12 to 18 months, depending on what tool you're looking at. So seasonality isn't even noted in there unless you dial in and and dive down and look at the estimated search volume per month. So seasonality is in there too. That said, it still can give you an idea, and this is why it's important. The search volume gives you an idea from a relative standpoint from one keyword to another. So it might not be the exact search volume, but you'll understand this search term gets about 10 times more than another one or 20 times or whatever. And then you know there's a lot more uh, competition. There's a lot more people looking for this specific keyword and that sort of thing. Number three is building the website. Hosting is a commodity. It's fairly straightforward. There's a couple companies I use, SiteGround and MDD Hosting, and I'm a, an affiliate for each. And basically, there's some plugins you could use. You could pick a theme. There's some pretty straightforward things that you can do. By the way, I'm, I'm just summarizing right now, but if you want to dive in, you can go to nichesiteproject.com slash Amazon dash affiliate. And there's a link in the description. Next, you write the content. Highly recommend, you know, you write the first content yourself, the first, you know, several pieces yourself. You can hire folks. Uh, Some people did ask about AI content. And I think a lot of people are using AI content. I'm not convinced it's the best way to earn a lot of money. And if a friend was telling me, or if a friend asked me if they should write the content themselves or publish 10 times more content with AI tools, I would probably tell them to write it themselves. I'm not sure what the threshold is for me, but I mean, if you do that quick math, uh, I think it's 10 times better if you're a good writer and you write it yourself. I've done some demos with AI tools, so you can check the videos on that. And thanks to everyone. There's 44 uh, thumbs up, and I appreciate it. If you haven't hit the thumbs up and liked the video, I would love it if you did. I appreciate everyone that, that already liked it, and thanks if you're able to do it. I'm going to answer a um, couple questions at the end here. So you write the content. Next, um, you plan and execute your promotion and link building strategy. So you will have to decide, uh, do you want to do any link building? Some people don't want to, no matter um, how much I talk about it. They're just like, I don't want to do it. It sounds too risky. Thanks, uh, whoever hit the thumbs up there. And I think even if you don't build links, I think it can be very valuable and effective to network within your niche. So you'll know the other people. And they could be sort of competitors, but I highly recommend that you go outside like website competitors and connect with people in social media. They often don't have websites, so they won't view you as a competitor directly. And it's, I mean, if you're into it anyway, if you're interested, then it's a no brainer to go ahead and sort of network and be friends with those folks. And that's kind of the idea. That's, that's the goal. Finally, you can uh, also do some email marketing, which is cool. I think there's a question about that in a a second. And then finally, scale. So you can grow your site even more or you can potentially start other new sites. And most people do opt to create more sites. I generally would recommend you just keep working on the one. There's some downsides to that. If you get hit by an algorithm update, then while well, you're hit by an algorithm update <laughs> and you only have your one site there, uh, which is a bit of a, a problem, but it also makes it easier so that you know what to work on and when. 
and thanks everyone who hit the thumbs up. We went we went over 50, which is great. And we're pushing two hours here, which is also cool. So I'll answer a handful more questions and then maybe in a minute, I'll still have enough time to tell you why my voice sounds like I smoked cigars yesterday all day long. I did not. I did not do that. But it sure sounds like it. Okay. So a couple more questions. I'm sorry if I missed any of them along the way. I will hop back. I marked some very early uh, Nomad Overseas. uh, Oh, shoot. I missed it. He was asking about writing eBooks and stuff like that. Um, But you can write eBooks, publish on Kindle, and then potentially use that as a traffic source. Dougie Fresh says, at what stage did you create an LLC for your blogging business? What systems did you put in place before creating an LLC for legal protection? So I waited. So one of the things that I I definitely did was I worried about earning money and selling things before creating a business, uh, an LLC. And I actually have a corporation, not an LLC. It just, it made sense for what I was trying to do. And I also didn't worry about uh, branding and, you know, merch and other things that a lot of people do. And I, I had um, some specific friends that were like, Oh, we're getting a banner. We're getting like t-shirts and we're getting hats. We're getting the, all this branding stuff together. We're forming a business and they proceeded to just do all this work that looked like business But uh, the biggest piece of business is selling things and earning money. So if you don't have that piece, then you don't have a business. So I focused on earning money for several years. I formed my business after three years. So I earned money. I'm in the U.S. So I earned money uh, for about three years before I actually formed the business. And it was part-time for about two of those years. And then the third year, I got laid off from my corporate job and I was doing my own thing full-time. And once I got a lot of, um, you know, once I was earning enough money, I opted to form the business. And when you form the business, at least, again, not legal advice, and this is not financial advice, (laughs) it is only entertainment. This is what I did. So I've, I formed the company, and in the U.S., uh, generally, you'll save some money on the payroll-type taxes. So you do have an advantage there. Additionally, you can create uh, what's called a, for, a solo 401k. On my other show, Mile High Fi, we actually interviewed someone. The big advantage with a solo 401k is you, you have to have your own company, self-employed, and you can contribute as the employee. So I get a W-2. I have a W-2. So I, could, I can get a mortgage. I have uh, income and revenue. I have my own salary and I get a W-2. With a solo 401k, you could actually contribute as the employee and the employer. If you contribute as the employer, you can um, contribute more than the normal at this uh, year, 2022, $20,500. You can contribute more than that. So you could actually contribute um, up to, I can't remember, it's 50 some odd thousand dollars. So for your 401k, instead of putting in $20,500, you could put in like $54,000, something like that, which is obviously dramatically higher. So if you have a high income and your company's earning good money, you can fill up your 401k in, uh, I mean, you could put a lot of money in there. You can put a lot of money um, if you max it out year over year for a few years. So, but the big thing is, you know, you could wait until say you hit a certain threshold um, where you're like, okay, I'm making enough money where I will save I will save a lot on payroll and some taxes. I think it's like, I can't remember, it's like seven point some odd percent. And then you'll have to look for the point where 
that savings exceeds the cost that it uh, takes with maybe the bookkeeping or accounting or, or whatever. If you know how to do the accounting yourself, it's no big deal um, in, in taxes and all that. But you do have to file as a LLC or a corporation. Um, generally, not always, but generally an S corp is what you would want to do. So I, I have a corporation with an S corp. I have a W2 of solo 401k. As far as the systems in place before creating the LLC, uh, virtually nothing. So I, I, I did it and then figured it out afterwards. And then the other thing, again, not legal advice, you know, the, the LLC is a limited liability corporation, right? So limited liability. So that can be a little bit helpful, but what I've heard is um, people could just, they could still sue you. <laughs> so it, it can be helpful, but like if someone wants to sue you, then they could just, they could still sue you. So, and they could go after your personal assets as well. So uh, Neo says the lowest niche gets how much RPM? I don't know. Don't know. And Gaz says, do you think that with the last few updates in the way Google is going that a site's metrics will ever have more weight on DA than backlinks? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know that. Anything's possible, right? I mean, we, we didn't even know any of this stuff before. Um, but it, it seems like, you know, links are pretty important. And, and the thing is the, the site, a site's metrics, um, de, can you define the site's metrics? So site's metrics, you know, as I think of it, um, I, I usually think about like the external factors, but are you talking about like the number of posts or the, the word count or, or something else? Um, and I, I mean, I think now maybe if you mean like the, the site's metrics as far as like what Google deems, uh, you know, visitor satisfaction or something like that. You know, that is obviously important and it is kind of going that way. A uh, quick uh, note, bef we only have uh, like six minutes left because uh, I know Alex over at WP Eagle does have a live stream coming up. So I'll end um, before then so people can go over there. Alex Cooper and Mark Mars and Adam Smith from Niche Website Builders. They're gonna be joining me tomorrow at 8 a.m. for the Niche Lifestyle Show. We're gonna be talking about what to do to grow a site from $500 per month to 10,000. Marcus says, how do you get people to confirm email subscriptions, the double opt-in because of GDPR? Um, most of the email platforms allow like the confirmation, the double opt-in. So that's how I have it set up. I did a couple things a few years ago that reduced the number of email opt-ins. So my, my email list didn't grow as fast, but it's higher quality. So my open rate somewhere, it's like 28 to 30 some odd percent or so. And around 30%, which is very high for a marketing uh, email list, but yeah, it's just a standard double opt-in. Oh, and that boy Robin says caught uh, live finally. Uh, love from Denver. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we got uh, cooler weather uh, these last couple days, which is great. Uh, that boy Robin says, "Do I use ClickBank at all? Uh, currently, not now. No, I don't. Uh, I have in the past." Uh, and it, it was fine, but a lot of those products were kind of, at least the ones that I was like, or promoting, they weren't that, uh, great. It, it worked great for the specific industry, but I think they were a bit predatory, um, around the survival space. All right. We're wrapping up here. Uh, learn easy says, can I rank my website without redirect links, which is paid? Uh, yes, you can. I'm not even sure what that means, but you, you can. Oh, and Marcus says, how do you get people 
to confirm, I feel like a lot of people don't. And that, that is, that's the thing. If they, if they don't care enough to double opt-in, then you probably don't want them on your list. Um, they're probably not going to open any of your other emails. Um, made by Marson says what to do if everything looks okay from, uh, uh, looks okay, but traffic from Google is still low after five months. I get one to, or sorry, I get two to six clicks from Google keywords are show, ch chosen correctly. Sometimes KGR, sometimes low difficulty. Basically five months is still a little young, uh, Six months is often referred to as like the sandbox period, but some people, uh, some sites rather take about a year to get out. So I would say you're still kind of young, Marson, but stick with it. Generally, you know, I'd want to see a little bit more than that, but it does depend on a number of factors. Okay, and uh, Gaz says, I was still flatlining at five months. The next two to three months will start to get exciting. Yep. Okay, and then where, where's this other joker here? Um, just got to kick this guy out. Okay. All right, so Alex is getting going here in just a minute. So... I was in uh, Montana, went to uh, Yellowstone, passed through Yellowstone in Wyoming, stopped in Cody, Wyoming, which was kind of cool, drove through Yellowstone. Um, we used to live in Bozeman, Montana, so we drove up through the park, which was great. We saw 100 bison. I mean, it was amazing. I have some very cool pictures, which I'll probably share before too long. And then also we had um, the three days in Bozeman, which was great. We got to visit some friends, hang out. And that was very cool. It's a, it's a great town. And then we headed over to Missoula where I helped uh, do some beer judging stuff. So I was a proctor, um, helped out for a beer judge certification program test. So people were testing to be uh, beer judges. And I haven't talked about it at all, but I'm a certified beer judge. I'm actually a fairly highly ranked one. So national level and sometimes they get us to help out. So I, it was a great excuse to go up to Missoula. And the cool thing is there was a, a beer fest. So I was one of the um, judges for the pro, you know, brewer festival. So I got to judge beer and then I sat and judged the best in show. So it was me and another guy named Ted and a gal named Sarah, who was kind of a new judge, but she sat in with us to uh, do that. The best in show was cool. And, you know, tried like 26 beers, uh, all, all the best from different categories. And then actually like went up and announced the, the winners with Ted. So we got up on stage and everything and got to shake hands and, and give the awards out. So that was pretty cool. And then we drank a bunch of beer. And then on Sunday, we drove all the way back home, which was, I think we were like door to door, like in the car, including stops for like 14 hours. So it was kind of a long day, but made it back home. We're, we're good road trippers. So that worked out um, pretty well, <laughs> pretty well overall. But um, long day. I tried not to talk too much, but, you know, still at a festival or whatever, your voice gives out a bit. And then funny thing, I actually sound worse today than I did on Sunday or Monday, I did uh, get a lot of good sleep last night. So maybe it's just my, my body recovering still. So that concludes it for today. Thanks everyone for uh, hanging in there. And I think Alex is starting. Um, I will uh, close out. I'll, I'll play out here. I haven't, I didn't play much guitar over the, uh, the week here because I didn't uh, bring my guitars with me. Um, but Sometimes I play guitar at the end here. This spring's a little loud there. Let's see. I don't even know what to, to play here. 
because I haven't in a bit. So I'll just make it quick, I think. And if, and if you don't like music, then you won't like this. Catch y'all in, in the morning, 8 a.m. at the Niche Lifestyle Show. <laughs>